basically, I prepared a little more like popular talk about RNA design. Uh, I call it the cartoon guide to RNA design. And uh, yeah, so Cody and I are from Aarhus University in Denmark and uh, have, are just visiting here for a few days uh, to uh, yeah, discuss RNA design uh, with you guys. Okay, so let's uh, start. Um, so first of all, I want to explain to you yeah, what we do in nanoscience, uh, uh, why we use molecules and uh, to design nanostructures. So basically there's two approaches to, to nanoscience. One is uh, top-down, where you uh, uh, take a material and you sculpt it with uh, a micro-scale instrument, and then we can do really nice uh, uh, nanostructures. But uh, another approach is a uh, bottom-up approach, uh, where we use uh, biomolecules to like sculpt and paint uh, uh, structures. Uh, and the great thing about uh, bottom-up is that w uh, if you understand the, the, the molecules right, we can actually make them assemble by themselves into intricate and uh, advanced uh, structures. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, so one good example is uh, DNA, uh, where we basically use the DNA-based pairing uh, to program which molecules will assemble together. We can program that, and yeah, two strands can meet each other and form a, a nice uh, DNA helix. Um, yeah, then we kind of need to build with DNA helices, like Lego bricks. We somehow need to uh, stitch them together. And uh, here we use DNA crossovers. So it's basically yeah, taking one strand and uh, okay. Oh, oops, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Just go back to PowerPoint. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So, but uh, double crossovers uh, are, are used to stitch DNA uh, helices together. And it basically means uh, designing one strand that kind of jumps from one helix to the other. Uh, now we can, can start building. And uh, yeah, basically in DNA nanotechnology, uh, yeah, it has, yeah, this basic principle has been extended to really large structures. And one nice example is DNA origami, where we take a lot of uh, small strands, uh, design them so that they anneal to a longer strand. And then in a kind of temperature ramp, we anneal the small strands to the large strand, and uh, they then go undergo this assembly process where you actually then end out with your, your uh, desired and designed structure. So yeah, in, in my lab, uh, yeah, we, we really want to design biomolecules, uh, trying to yeah, take this uh, powerful uh, assembly processes and, and design structures, make technology out of it. And here, in this cartoon, uh, kind of show the process. Uh, we start out with a, a good idea. That's the starting point. Then we use uh, computers with some nice uh, specialized software for the task. We design our molecules. We order them from a, a synthesis company. And then when we get them back in the lab, we, we pipe it and assemble them. And uh, it eventually out pops these uh, nice nanostructures. The only thing that's kind of tricky is that nanostructures are so small that you are not able to see them. So in this case, we, we use uh, different microscopes to visualize that they, we actually made what, what we designed on the computer. Here is an example. This is atomic force micros microscopy, where we use a cantilever to kind of feel the surface of a, of a molecule. And then it's kind of projected on the computer screen. And we can see what, what happened. So yeah, researchers have been working on this for quite some time now. And uh, yeah, uh, back in 2006, uh, uh, this smiley face uh, was made. Uh, this is a planar structure and analyzed by, by AFM. Then later, this technology was developed into more three-dimensional structures uh, seen on the bottom and, and the top right. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, basically, the, this is the way it goes. Uh, but what we really want to do is, is not just creating structures. Actually, what we want to achieve is uh, that we want to build nanorobots. And nanorobots can perform important tasks. And uh, yeah, so one of the first examples of like dynamic <laughs> DNA nanostructures were yeah, this uh, dolphin-like shape uh, uh, with a flexible tail. It's kind of a, just a funny example. But uh, then later on, yeah, basically, we have been working on different uh, containers uh, that have lids that can 
have a lock and key system and can be open and closed. And uh, the example here on the right is, uh, is this uh, uh, robot uh, from the uh, from Sean Douglas, where he uh, designed a, a structure like a clamshell that could recognize a cancer cell, open up, and release some some signals that would uh, induce this cell to to undergo apoptosis. Uh, another kind of uh, robots are shown at the bottom. Uh, so here, the DNA uh, organ. Example is a, a, an assembly line where we can kind of walk along the DNA structure and pick up cargo. And in another case, uh, yeah, we yeah, uh, we have like a, a, a path for a, a something called a molecular spider that can then kind of walk along the path and and uh, perform different tasks. So, but yeah, so this is all very good uh, and and quite advanced, but. If we want to go even more advanced, what, what what could we do? And here, the trick is to go and, and try to mimic nature. <clears throat> and uh, actually, nature is uh, kind of which uh, uh, is the factory for producing uh, proteins. And to do that, it undergoes a really dynamic and fascinating uh, process uh, to, to make this happen. And, and also the other thing we see is that actually the ribosome is composed of RNA, so maybe actually RNA might be the material we want to use uh, if we want to build something that's even more complex uh, and can perform uh, even more advanced tasks. <coughs> so here's a little uh, overview of yeah, how uh, <laughs> uh, RNA is translated into protein. The sound field. Okay. Yep. Um. Fine. Okay, great, great. <clears throat> yeah, so how RNA is in, uh, translated into protein uh, by the ribosome. So here it's kind of taken a, a, a situation from the United Nations uh, where uh, there's a one uh, 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 person here speaking uh, the language of RNA. Uh, and this uh, RNA language has a special kind of syntax where there's kind of correlations uh, forming uh, uh, structures like this. Uh, but but uh, then, yeah, at the translation desk, uh, this language is translated into uh, protein language. And uh, here, there's another type of uh, uh, yeah, interactions and so on going on. So this why is... Did, why did you pick Arabic? <laughs> why did you pick Arabic? <laughs> uh, only because of the wordplay with the uh, yeah, ribo <laughs> nucleic acid uh, kind of had uh, that you know flavor. flavor you and, know where uh, the ribos came from? <laughs> no. It comes from it's um it comes from the word ribonic acid, okay. which was an anagram of um, um, arab. Oh, sorry, it comes from it's an anagram of arabinos. Okay. Okay, and actually, it's a, it's a silly wordplay where <laughs> in this I think due to the French, um, where they took arabinos and they made it ana arabinos. They took out a and a, which is like removing something, mm -hmm. and they rearranged the words to make it ribonic or ribose. Okay. And it was, it's a totally made up word. It has no roots whatsoever, okay. except in Arabic, which is why I asked you. Okay, no, no, I, I, I didn't <laughs> know that connection. Arabic knows, which comes from Arabic, and <laughs> gum, gum Arabic. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's uh, very interesting. Also, really quickly, there's uh, yeah. a really strong positive response from, from people in the Eternal Chat. Okay, okay. <laughs> on the cartoons. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so I want uh, initially to, to uh, explain to you yeah, how important RNA is in biology. Uh, uh, so, yeah, and also what kind of functions it perform. And here I kind of show an overview of uh, the central dogma of how RNA is produced from DNA, and then how it's exported uh, through, out through the nucleus and out uh, yeah, to the cytoplasm where the ribosome, which is also made by RNA, then captures the messenger RNA and produces uh, all the functional proteins. <laughs> so, but, but it mainly shows that RNA is, is both central, it's very central to the production of, of proteins, uh, but actually, RNA has a lot of other functions in the cell uh, to regulate and orchestrate uh, the whole uh, machinery. And here is like one example: uh, uh, RNA interference, where yeah, one RNA that's expressed in the cell gets chopped up by a protein called DICER. Then you have a small RNA called an sRNA that uh, then kind of enters into a complex called uh, RISC. That uh, yeah, here in the shape of a pirate, <laughs> kind of uh, goes and either slices an RNA uh, into pieces or kind of uh, yeah, stops the 
uh, ribosome from from translation, transla translating the message. <clears throat> uh, another place where RNA really plays a big role is like uh, for viruses. Uh, there's a lot of RNA viruses like the the HIV virus. Uh, in this case here, you can see how the virus actually uh, goes through the cell, infects it, and inserts itself in the genome, express many different RNAs, and and then it's uh, kind of packaged in a new virus particle, and, and a new uh, uh, virus is formed. The, the, the main thing here is that actually that the steering the virus through, through the cell. Uh, yeah, if we kind of zoom in here, I uh, can show you some of the uh, details. Uh, so here's an, an example where we kind of zoom in to, to the reverse the copying of the RNA virus. Uh, and actually here, the RNA kind of guides the polymerase or the reverse transcriptase to jump from one strand to the other through something called that's called a, a kissing interaction. Um, so, so it's just some of these uh, things that RNA does. Uh, OK. So now I kind of want to turn a bit of way uh, uh, and give you a big uh, overview so of what RNA does, uh, uh, how it has evolved function. And actually, uh, RNA has this central role in the uh, uh, initiation of life on Earth. That's uh, what has uh, been proposed, where RNA kind of was the first molecule to figure out how to copy itself. And that kind of get, gave rise to the whole evolution of, of life. So, so that's like a, a, an early invention of RNA <laughs> structure. Then later, of course, the ribosome was uh, invented uh, through evolution. And uh, it's kind of the, the workhorse uh, that translates uh, yeah, RNA into protein. And, uh, but then, actually, the tasks of RNA has been uh, yeah, really uh, ever expanding. And uh, actually, also today, we have a lot of RNA uh, inside <laughs> our cells. Like like almost all of our genomes are, is expressed as RNA, and RNA still has this kind of uh, master composer function in many of the cellular processes. So if we then go on uh, to recent days, uh, now we kind of are starting to design molecules in a new way. Uh, so here, like I talked before uh, about DNA, uh, RNA. function in the cell. And uh, yeah, in this case here, you often have a programmer that will like sit and design these uh, uh, RNA structures uh, and uh, make them uh, work in reality. OK, so uh, let's go on. So how, how do we actually do that? How do we take nature's molecules and kind of design them uh, for our purpose? Uh, To, to help us uh, doing this. And yeah, here shown by uh, that the, pro the computer somehow has to, to look at the uh, sequence of the RNA and figure out what, how, how do we fold this molecule. OK, so, so here's a more uh, vanilla slide uh, kind of showing uh, yeah, how uh, this process uh, is, is, is going. So yeah, basically, you have, first of all, like the, the standard way in biology has been to sequence and figure out what, what structures does yeah, the, bio, the natural molecules have. So you basically start out with the real molecules. You, you go through this process of, process of sequencing, and you can then kind of get all of these sequences out. And sometimes you can use computer programs to, yeah, from a sequence, you can predict a secondary structure. In some cases, you can go on and predict a three-dimensional structure. There's, of course, of all costs also this uh, possibility that we, uh, through different biophysical techniques, can, can directly determine the three-dimensional structure of a molecule. And this is really what, what, uh, what, where the whole field is going. We want to understand uh, all the structure of uh, biology. But on the other hand, here on the right, uh, yeah, we have this uh, design paradigm. So, and in this case, it's a slightly different. Uh, we actually normally start out designing three-dimensional structures. And as I told you before, kind of making these crossovers to link uh, uh, yeah, helices and uh, motifs together. Uh, then yeah, we go on and kind of make a blueprint of the structure and uh, use algorithms. Actually, the same algorithms that's used for prediction, we can use somehow for design to, to figure out which sequences uh, uh, can be used 
And then, yeah, we go through this process of self-assembly that I talked about before, and we get our structure, and then we can characterize them and compare if uh, our 3D model fits with the actual uh, experiments. And uh, the, the thing I want you to kind of see here is that uh, this process of design is like a circular path. So it basically means that we can go around here uh, designing and comparing our design to, to our models and, and, and figure, and then gradually optimizing uh, uh, yeah, our designs, and eventually we'll uh, figure out uh, how, uh, what are the rules to design molecules. Okay, so uh, here I'm just showing a few representations of uh, yeah, what RNA looked like. Of course, in reality, we have something here like the three-dimensional model uh, with all the uh, atoms here in a kind of cartoonish uh, uh, representation. Uh, we also have uh, these uh, blueprints called secondary structure programs, and uh, here, like in Eterna, this is uh, uh, yeah most used uh, representation. We, there's also other ways to show it here. Something called arc diagram, where we kind of on the at the length of the molecule, kind of show with the arcs which base uh, pairs with which other base. And at last, we have this dot dot bracket format down here at the bottom, which just is uh, this one line of uh, interactions uh, where one bracket uh, uh, pairs with uh, another bracket. OK, so uh, yeah, now I kind of reached the, uh, the end of almost the end of the talk here, but uh, and I, I hope I kind of showed you uh, what uh, RNA can do and what and that we uh, have these options to design RNA molecules, and then uh, we can uh, yeah make a lot of fun functions and uh, or make a lot of applications out of that. And uh, here I'm kind of introducing. Uh, this uh, origami method, which basically mean, means that we are folding RNA in a kind of very systematic uh, manner. And I'm showing two uh, different versions. One is the scaffolded RNA origami, where we, yeah, like I to told you before, just exchange the strands that we, earlier on we used DNA, but here we can now use RNA and make a similar kind of uh, assembly. But this assembly requires uh, this temperature ramp uh, to make the structures form what is maybe more interesting and what Cody will introduce in much more detail is uh, single-stranded RNA origami. And here we basically try to do the same that nature does, that uh, yeah, basically the RNA uh, folding is encoded in the DNA uh, sequence. And then an enzyme called an um, RNA polymerase uh, binds to the, R the DNA sequence and then transcribes the RNA uh, from that DNA sequence and out uh, pops now this blue RNA uh, structure. The, the big trick here that Cody has uh, accomplished uh, very uh, nicely is uh, to make these helices fold up in a given order uh, during this process and uh, click together and form a, a regular structure at the end. So yeah, uh, there's a little uh, picture we took uh, trying to kind of show the difference between scaffolded origami, where we use these stables to kind of make the structure. And as you can see, it's a bit cheating. Uh, putting in that many staples to uh, keep a structure together. But uh, what, what we like to s uh, think is that RNA origami, where we don't use any, any staples, just use one single strand of RNA is a, a much finer uh, uh, work of art. <laughs> OK, so, so here's a, a nice uh, drawing of what such an RNA origami structure looks like. And yeah, well, some of the tricks, uh, of course, is to, to get the three-dimensional geometry right. So every element of this structure kind of fits together and clicks together uh, during uh, this process. OK, so yeah, with that, <coughs> I'll end the talk and, and just say that uh, we only got very, uh, not that far yet, uh, towards designing uh, ribosomes. But uh, uh, there's, there's a long way to go. But, but we're taking maybe some of the initial steps to, to figure out how to, to fold RNA uh, for you know, their particular applications and functions. And at the end, I just want to acknowledge, uh, yeah, especially Cody, uh, who has been uh, working on this project uh, uh, for uh, some years now, and uh, Paul Rothermond at uh, Caltech that we've been collaborating heavily with to kind of uh, uh, get started on, on this. Um, and then, yeah, all the other people in, the, in my lab. And uh, yeah, and thank you, everybody, for, for listening. Thank you.
We have questions, questions from here. We have questions from here. Okay. Also, we'll take okay. questions from here. Okay. There's a new right. way, so we're still getting questions. Okay. Yeah. Right. Great. 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 So, uh, uh, the main <laughs> two questions. The one is from Eli Fisker. Okay. Uh, these RNA cartoon images are simply amazing. Are they published in the book anywhere? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. Actually, they're, they're not uh, published. Uh, so, so it's uh, my cartoons uh, that I've kind of been doing during the years uh, to kind of, uh, yeah, somehow visualize the science that we do and maybe also make it more friendly uh, to to people. But it's mainly been used in like uh, yeah, scientific uh, presentations and, and so on, but, but I'll yeah, uh, put them online so people can, can use them if they want. Some of them will be, will be online through this podcast. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I guess two other questions um, so far. Um, okay, again, a lot of positive response. It is based on Cody. <laughs> the, the yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's uh, my, inter yeah. my interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you you drew them? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So, and then um, Jay Anderson Lee asks, uh, when does this stuff get added to Eterna? Oh, <laughs> uh, what stuff? I'm assuming you mean the tiles. Oh, uh, the tiles. Yes. Uh, so that's uh, uh, yeah, it can be done, of course. Uh, we can talk about it some more. Cody, you're going to talk a bit more yeah. about the tiles, right? Yes, I will. So yeah. let's revisit that after uh, after Cody's talk. In some sense, they are in Eterna, but not in quite such a good form. Okay. Well, I would say they're already halfway on Eterna, and uh, in a time in the future, I envision we will be able to have larger sequences, in which case we can have the other half. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I think it should be extended. Yes. And we'll take more questions after Cody's. Great. Click play here. Okay. So is this um, is it showing my screen or the projection it's showing? Yeah, it's projector. Okay. Yeah. Good. So first of all, thank you, Eva, for that really delightful introduction to biochemistry and the way that RNA scientists think about the world through the lens of RNA. And so now I'm going to give a little bit more detail, and this is a slightly more technical talk, but there's lots of graphics, so hopefully it will entertain you all. And to start out, the, we're, we're talking about RNA origami, so leaving off from the last slide that Eva showed. Um, and in his picture is sort of a, an artistic representation of how the T7 polymerase is scooting along these DNA templates and producing the tiles dynamically. And I just imagine them floating all over the place and these tiles eventually coming and sticking to a surface. And we were using the surface at this stage to uh, image what's happening. Um, but Oh, I do have a mouse. Okay. So uh, just a quick review here. RNA and DNA are both double helices, and uh, for that sense, they, they kind of tend to get uh, mixed up a little bit in the, in the eyes of, a, um, I think, the general public, uh, because they really look uh, very much dissimilar. Uh, so I'll just point out the minor differences here. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of difference in the helicity, the number of base pairs per turn. Small difference in the diameter. Uh, what's cool about RNA is you look down at like this, and it looks like a soda straw, so the bases go around the center, whereas in the DNA, they go right through the center. And the other kind of detail about RNA is the bases here, are they come in in a tilt of about 20 degrees. And this, uh, this tilt is maybe not that much, but in, a, in the context of a larger structure, it adds up. So uh, it's something we should consider. Um, if you just kind of tilt the helix a little bit more and look, uh, instead of directly down the side, through the side, um, the DNA here has a major groove and a minor groove. And that is historically because the major <coughs> groove is uh, quite wide and the minor groove is quite narrow. But on RNA, uh, we call them a deep and shallow groove because actually the major groove on RNA is kind of narrow, uh, but it's very deep. And the shallow groove is wide, uh, but it's also more accessible. And that has a consequence that a lot of complicated uh, RNA packing interactions tend to occur through the shallow groove instead because it's the more accessible of the two strands. Um, and so here's a, a slide kind of summarizing why, why is it that we want to use RNAs, and I think it's because they, they form these beautiful three-dimensional shapes. And the shapes that they form are themselves carrying the function. So that means if we study what nature has, and it's a wide variety, a wealth of three-dimensional information that we can mine, uh, if we can understand how the three-dimension 
information works, uh, and then we can encode new three-dimensional shapes, that means we can also control the function that comes with those shapes. And I think the more that we dig in and understand how to program RNA at a three-dimensional level, the more we will be able to express new functions in this polymer. And just for an example, um, here's from a paper from 2010 where we took the structure of a tRNA. Now, this is not your typical tRNA. It's a class 2 tRNA, and uh, the reason it's different is because it has this little branch that comes out of the corner. And so it has this tripod shape. And this is a very technical slide, uh, but really all you're supposed to get from it is that actually it's a tripod shape, and the angles between all these arms is really set in, is really set in stone, and it's encoded by all the blue residues that are the motif. And if you go out and you try to make a new thing, you don't have to know how the blue nucleotides pair with each other. If you just put that pattern in a thing, you'll have this 25, 70, 90 degree bends end. And um, it's actually a real thing. And, if we, and in the paper, we made eight of these particles and stuck them together, and you end up with this twisted square. And so there's a really good correlation between the three-dimensional model we were able to build from the crystal structure of one little piece and the actual data which we obtained by multimerizing eight of them together. And, and um, that, I think, exhibits the power and the angstrom level precision in which we can position things with RNA. Um, if you take it a step further, we can we can do really advanced design. We can combine a large number of very complicated components together using different motifs. Now, some of these may have appeared on Eterna again. Maybe this uh, adenosine aptamer has been used in a previous lab. We we use these kissing loops interactions. So, um, and I think also there was a three-dimensional lab recently with 11 nucleotide, you know, this tetra loop receptor junction. So, so these are some of my favorite motifs. Uh, happy family of RNA. and You can combine them all together in one pot and they all work <laughs> together. And it's three-dimensional structure and what you get out. So on the left, these are atomic force microscope images that are done in like the way that cartoon was showing the said that there's a little tip that scans around the surface and feels the molecules. And on the right, um, these are these are cryo-EM uh, class average which uh, just shows that uh, you know this one, this one, the uh, molecules aren't being touched, so that's the shape. Um, and so now I'm just going to walk you through sort of the method of designing RNA structures. And actually, this is very similar to the way that the RNA design module in Eterna works. It's actually the same thing. Uh, we start out by pulling out modules from crystal structures from the database. Um, and then we sort of rearrange them using these gray regions, which are just helices. And, and your variable is what motifs do you want to put and how much helix do you glue in between them. And once you do that, uh, it spits out a, a two-dimensional structure, and that's a consensus diagram. And then you send this out to an algorithm or maybe to Eterna players who will fill in all the blanks with some sequence that will fold happily into that design. And then it comes back to us, and we do experiments try to characterize what comes out of it, and then maybe we have to revise and go through the cycle. Um, so we call this the RNA architectonics methodology, and this was, this was pioneered by my PhD advisor, Luke Yeager. And here, I'll just show a little movie which shows how we take, go from RNA modules to a three-dimensional design. And so in this picture here, we see four different loops. And I mean, at first glance, they're just loops. Um, but what's cool is when they stick together, uh, those loops carry three-dimensional information. It defines um, a precise <coughs> angle. And so on the top, the green ones, they make a 120-degree bend. And on the bottom, the blue ones, they make a 180-degree bend. And uh, that has to do with you know, some other type of three-dimensional constraints, like where ions bind and things that are kind of complicated. But in the end, we can just use them as Lego bricks. And um, the RNA helices here, the, these are shown in orange. They, they function as the support beams. And the helices, you know, we can join them and make different types of shapes using crossover connections. Uh, so here it's showing making that double crossover. Uh, from this stable scaffold, we can glue in the motifs. Uh, so here, the blue one, that's the, the straight kissing loop. We can use that to rigidify the center. And then these ones that define little angles, we'll put them on the on the corner edges. And here we show just the final structure going through a process called polishing, where after we merge all these rough fragments together, maybe we'll refine and clean up the model so that things are all nice and smooth. 
And so that's, that's how an RNA, RNA origami tile is made. And on the edges, of course, we put these 120 degree bend structures. And so this will just show uh, how those define um, the angles that form between units. So the actual quaternary large scale structure is defined by these loops. Right. So before you actually show us that, uh, what, you, what you made, um, can, would you mind answering a few questions? There's, please, yeah, there's a please. Bunch of, yeah. <laughs> huge amount of engagement and a bunch of really, really good questions. Awesome. Um, so uh, so the, uh, I'm going to go all the way back to um, why did the, uh, when you talk about the tiles, um, uh, Jam Shinley says we love the tile lab, so uh, kudos. Um, there's a question from Machine Elves. The phrase temperature wrap was interesting. Temperature ramp. I think maybe Ebbe used that. Oh, theory. yeah, I think Ebbe was talking about temperature ah, so ramp. So I want to understand what that is. Okay. So uh, typically it was DNA origamis. Uh, they're, they're, they're formed by a process called annealing, where you have all those different strands mixed together in solution, and there's a bunch of stuff. And uh, the way to prevent all that stuff from sticking together is to, to warm them up. So you start out at a pretty hot temperature, and that keeps everything separate. And then you gradually, maybe over a period of hours, or sometimes in the case of days, slowly cool the temperature. And that gives a lot of time for these things to come together in a very slow and ordered fashion. And that's called an annealing ramp. And uh, that's, that's the way that a lot of DNA origamis are formed. And also, it works with RNA structures as well. Um, but, but really, the goal is you know, cells, they produce RNA every day. And they just do so at whatever temperature they're living at. And, and so uh, if we can manage to do things at a fixed temperature and, and just have the enzymes produce the RNAs and the RNAs fold up at one temperature, we think this would be more ideal and maybe more useful in the long run. Would you say that almost all 3D um, DNA origamis require some kind of annealing or temperature? Yeah. Is that the case with your work, Evie? Uh, yeah, yeah. So for the origami, uh, the DNA origami, the, 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 there's some different temperature ramps that, that uh, are being used. Uh, so, so for uh, like flat structures, uh, one uh, two-dimensional structures, uh, they can normally be formed quite fast in like half an hour to an hour. But, but then uh, for, for the more three-dimensional structures where helices are packed really tight, and then often like a really uh, a longer ramp is, is needed uh, because yeah, uh, there's more repulsion in, in, inside the structure. So, so there it could, in some cases, be all uh, yeah, like five days. Uh, uh, yeah. so, so it's uh, yeah, not that efficient. Yeah. Right. I should also point out, though, that in the DNA field, they are working on the problem as well of trying to make things work at a fixed temperature. But it's a little tricky because um, to figure out what that target temperature is, it's different for every structure, and it requires some work to figure out like what the magic temperature to incubate a DNA origami is. And with RNA, uh, I'd like to say everything happens at body temperature. So that's 37C, and uh, that's the target. It's not like you know we want to go for any other temperatures other than body temperature. So. There's a question from Jay Anderson Lee. What, when you talked about motifs at the beginning of your slides, you mentioned some non wasser crick pairs. So um, he's asking, um, are there any beyond GU or UG? Oh, yes. There's a whole family of these. Uh, there's actually 12 different classes of uh, RNA interactions. And it comes out to 12 because an RNA uh, has the Watson Crick side, which makes the hydrogen bonds in the normal base pair. But then it's got the major groove and the minor groove side. And so those three sides times three sides on its partner gives you like uh, 12 possibilities. And because you can also have um, them you know, making a trans interaction. That's kind of hard to explain. But you know, if you hold your hands in front of you with your thumb both sticking up, that's cis. And if you have one thumb up and one thumb down, that would be trans. So there's like you know, three different edges and two different ways to pair each one. And that leads with uh, yeah. six times two. Probably we should have at some point a special class on the non wanting quick pairs for eternal pairs. Yeah, I think, I that's think a lot like of people a, would love it. I think <laughs> it's like a whole other soup of things. Yeah. And, uh, for you now, know. they just have to be building blocks that we use. There yeah. is a question. I think you showed a picture of the um, Valentine um, about what is the gray stuff on the top right image? And I don't, I actually don't know what um, gray, gray stuff. We can't go backwards. Can we go backwards? Or I can go it? backwards, that's yeah. No, it was in the cryo Oh, it's in the cryo There's great stuff in the cryo Oh, 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 okay. Well, let's go back to that. Okay. Well, it wants to play my transition so, know, so bear with me. Uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So so here you go. This is a, this is a cryo-EM, and so the, these are little RNA assemblies, and they're frozen in uh, some vitreous ice, and what the dark things are are the RNAs, and the light stuff is just some noise in the background. 
Um, so this is a cry OEM, and, that, and the reason there's so much granularity and noise is because the, these structures are really, really delicate. They're only one helix wide, and so we have to turn the signal up a lot to be able to see them at all. And on the bottom, we just inverted the colors to make it easier to see. Uh, but this, yeah. Okay. I, I hope that, that explains it good. Yeah, because yeah. I think I think the players are not yet used to looking at this microscopy data. Yeah. Although we hope in one or two years, um, this will be one of the platforms available for material press as they're designed. It's been so valuable for uh, prior work and RNA um, RNA design. Okay, the last question is: um, Machine elves would like to know a little bit more about what polishing entails. <laughs> yeah, po polishing is a bit of a <laughs> polishing is a bit of a black box to me. Um, so right now I'm using a, a an open source software suite. I think it's open source. It's called Assemble 2.0, and it works with a 3D engine called Chimera, which is a wonderful graphics engine if you want to like study PDB files and RNA in a lot more depth. And so what I'm doing is I'm I'm merging all these different RNA fragments together into a 3D model, but you know, where you join a motif to a helix, sometimes the atoms aren't lined up perfect. And this program will go through and look at that and will will actually make a stereochemically correct connection between them, which means it like looks at the bond length of every atom and then if they're wrong, then it moves something a little bit to fix it. And so it's kind of wiggling the atoms into place so that they seem more reasonable at the edges. Okay. Yeah, I think that helps. I mean, especially actually um, spreading the word about those software packages. I think you're going to see a big uptick in whoever's downloading Chimera. And oh, yeah. Now. <laughs> a noticeable uptick. Yeah, so Chimera is made by UC San Francisco. So uh, it's UCSF Chimera, and it's a great software package. Yeah. And Assemble 2 is coming out of Strasbourg, is that true? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, and there's a, one last question, but I, I want to revisit it at the very end of both of your talks. But I'll, uh, as a preview, maybe Eva can have, prepare an answer. Nando's asking, his work started on dynamic RNA origamis. For instance, a change in pH would cause a conformational change. Um, so let's let's come back to that. Okay. Let's discuss that all together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll come back to that one Just, later. You have to see what Cody's going to show you next. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So where was I? Okay, I'm talking about helices, and here here we have a representation of two crossover junctions, and these are perfectly analogous to the ones that were made in DNA. And the nomenclature here is a little weird: DAE and DAO, and what it means is double anti-parallel even and double anti-parallel odd. And what does even and odd mean? It, it refers to the number of half helical turns in between. So here you can see one, two, three, four. That's an even number. And on the odd one, there is one, two, three. So that's odd. And so it purely represents whether or not you have an even number or an odd number of half turns. And um, with the even structure, what's nice is that because it's even, all the slanted uh, of the bases, they kind of can't, they, they kind of line up, so you have the same number of base pairs on the top and bottom. That makes a nice symmetrical rhombus-shaped structure. And the DAO structure, because these things oppose each other, the slants kind of point the opposite direction. And that means you get an asymmetry, so the top is 19 base pairs wide, and the bottom is only 14 base pairs wide. And so geometrically, this is a little harder to figure out. Um, and I think, so that's, uh, that's that. <laughs> Um, and so in this example here, I'm showing one of the odd tiles, so it's wider on the top and narrower on the bottom, and this wide space is filled in with one of these kissing loop structures. So this is the 180-degree kissing loop, and this is actually the structure that's, that's in the last lab that we went through, uh, the kissing loop lab version 2, and I had uh, Eterna players try to design new sequences for this structure. And on the bottom, these are the 120-degree kissing loops, and they're just used to orient the tiles with respect to each other. Um, so here's just a and um, I'll just say when I said you know we, we did half of a tile well it's because we didn't have enough space in the shape probing setup to actually put the full sequence of this guy in so I had to kind of you know trim a little bit off but actually this structure that we made the core of it here is exactly the same as the core in the tile that we published. Um, but we, we just trimmed the edges and shortened some stems. And I know uh, some of the players were frustrated by how short these stems were. Uh, and I apologize for that. And uh, maybe maybe one day we can do like 200 nucleotides or something, and then we can <laughs> not have these short stems. But what was cool about the lab data um, is that we were expecting to see a really, really good protection pattern here. And we were expecting on these 
on these uh, bulges here, which just kind of point right out in the solution that maybe we will get some cleavage here. And what's really neat is actually in the shape probing data, you see these A's that don't pair are bright yellow, and the kissing loop actually is really dark blue. And, and here I map that onto the 3D molecule so you can see these guys. The point in solution are, are really getting modified a lot, and this one getting modified, but actually the kissing loop forms in it, and it pairs dark blue like a, like a nice helix auto look. So also kudos to Eterna players for picking nice designs of these stems and doing a really good job with that lab. So was that a chimera in the bottom? Or this? The bottom? Yeah, or yeah, 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 that's chimera. It's and interesting, after we just talked about chimera, <clears throat> you know, I posted two uh, Google Docs written by players on how to use chimera. Yeah. So awesome. So there's, there's already some knowledge about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely there's some players using it. Uh, yeah, and I wonder if, if they haven't figured out how to show the data like this, then this is a nice challenge for them. Oh, okay. So color the 3D models. You know, so we do the two with Primal. You, you can color things. Um, you can actually color things with Assemble. So Assemble, if you load in a 3D model, yeah. and then you load in an accompanying text file that just has, like, tells it what, you know, um, the actual shape data and paired with each nucleotide, yeah. it will go through and apply that uh, uh, quantitative data to the thing and then map it into Chimera and, like, actually and color every position. Scale, yeah, 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 I can do you that. You must have set up a template. Uh, no, I did it by hand because uh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to take the time to, to yeah, do okay. a template, but uh, it, it is possible to do that. So now, now that it's out there, maybe maybe some guy like Nando or something can <laughs> can program it in. That would be super cool. Hint, hint. Um, so let's go to uh, <laughs> the next part, which is the vision of like how we really want RNA origami to work, and we want to be able to produce it in real time and. That means that we have a polymerase here uh, marked out, and it's going to come and bind onto the gene. And once it starts binding and making RNA, the RNA folds up into little tiny structures as it goes along. And the idea is that hierarchically, it makes some helices and hairpins, and it makes some junctions, and then it makes some tertiary interactions. And all of this stuff happens in an ordered fashion, idealistically, and resulting in a perfectly folded structure at the end which then can go out about its business and do its function. In this case, the function is to assemble into hexagons so that I can image it really easily. Um, the other thing I'm going to note is to mainly to prepare you for the next slide is uh, the, the T7 polymerase goes from 5 prime to 3 prime, and it's really fast. And it, goes, it, it produces this stuff at about one origami per second. Um, <coughs> And that doesn't give a lot of time for the RNA to fold, but actually RNA folding happens on a microsecond time scale. So it is still folding uh, probably 1,000 times to 100 times faster than it's being produced. And so here is kind of a picture real time of how fast a polymerase might be making a tile, the size of the one I was showing. Uh, it's pretty quick. And I think after about five times through here, yeah, now, now I have it in slow motion to give you an, a vision of how the strand, as it's being produced, kind of goes through this dance and contorts around while it tries to fold into its structure. And it, this is a really dynamical and complicated process. It's hard to understand. Um, of course, after tiles are made, then they, then they can go out and assemble. And actually, the quaternary assemble could be quite complicated and happen in, you know, in like a series of stages. Like here I showed maybe in theory that it makes a a little tiny seed crystallite, and then after that, things stick to it. The truth is we actually have no idea how this goes about, and this is just a, a ma my imagination at work. But it tends to look like what we actually visualize, and so here there will be a little transition. Um, so now, now we see actual experimental data uh, from an AFM, and it's a little bit choppy because I sort of had to align a bunch of images captured at different scales so you could see. But the surface is in the... In the in the microscope is really covered by a lot of these RNA networks. Um, so in a little bit more detail, uh, the proposed assembly tile design was uh, originally a three-tile a three tile system. So I colored them red, yellow, and blue, A, B, and C. And um, it's actually not the fact that we made this sort of three-tile thing that, that makes the hexagonal assembly. It really is the shape of the connectors. Um, and that means that, you know, this hexagonal lattice, if we just leave out one of the three programmable tiles, then, then the two that are remaining should actually make these 120 degree bend shapes. And so I showed already some hexagons, but if we actually just make a two tile assembly, then we get these beautiful zigzaggy uh, swirly structures that look kind of like Van Gogh. 
Um, and if we zoom in a little bit more on the right here, you, you can actually see the zigzag and measure the angle and see that they're actually defined by this one little loop-loop interaction. And by comparison, if you just switch out the flavor of loops on the corners, uh, you can get a rectilinear shape. And so, so you can make different geometries of tiles just by changing a little motif. So one has the previous one here. The, these loops are, are nine nucleotides, and they form six base pairs between them. And now these loops, oh, I'm sorry, backwards. The, these, are, these are seven nucleotide loops. And these ones are nine nucleotide loops. So it's like just a, cha a small change can result in a different shape. And uh, now this is a more technical slide. I just, I just copied this over from the more technical and molecular programming conference we just went to. <laughs> but if you're interested, <laughs> the way you can prepare the RNAs, this is the typical way on the top, is we transcribe them in a reaction, and we purify them on a gel. And then we take those guys, and we mix them together, and we can, we can assemble them by different methods. Of course, the goal is to do this kind of thing, where we just mix everything into one tube and then have everything assembled together all at once. And so um, on the, the next slide I'm going to show you is actually just going to contrast these two top ones, one where we anneal everything in a solution, and another one where we mix the purified things together on the mica substrate. So on the top, when we just put everything into a tube together and, and then you know, anneal it at one temperature, uh, we get these proper hexagonal assemblies, but they're kind of messy, and you see like these bright spots mean that things are kind of piled on top of each other. So it's like when you mix But if you do this, this method, and here, here, here we have the mica surfaces, so that's the substrate where we put the RNAs, and we put the purified stuff on the, on the mica, and we cooled it over just 15 degrees, so it's not much. So cooling from kind of warm, 45 degrees to about room temperature over 90 minutes, that just gives enough time for these things to sort of come down in a systematic way, and then they fill up the whole surface nice and regular. Uh, just by contrast, a little bit the difference in the assembly protocol leads to a, a large observed difference. Um, but really, I'm interested in these more simple systems. So uh, here, here again is the nice clean setup, uh, but here's the one which I think is more important. We just mix the polymerase enzymes and the DNA together directly on the mica substrate, and then I kind of warm, you know, <laughs> went over this temperature gradient with all with everything mixed together and. This one, you can see the RNA polymerases, and these are these kind of bright blobs. And then you see some arrays here formed. And I think this is the nice proof where it shows that the system is very robust, and the future is to sort of get away from trying to do all these complicated protocols involving all these steps and just sort of be able to just put everything into one spot and have it go about its business. Um, and just to zoom in, uh, so here I'm going to make a zoom in of this nice little clean part for, for show. And uh, to see, you know, actually, atomic force microscopy, it goes through and measures the height of the RNA at all these different points. And so it, this is a nice 3D representation of that data. 500 nanometers on a square, so that's really, really <laughs> tiny. Um, so can we scale these structures up uh, like like what Eva was saying, our goal is to, to reach the ribosome size. And we're, this is definitely not the ribosome size, so can, can we can, you know, go a little bit bigger anyways? And um, how, how do we design things like that? Um, so here's a diagram on the top showing what a kind of a typical little chunk of a DNA origami might look like. And we have these long strands, and then we have a bunch of these shorter strands. So it's like a mul many little strands of DNA that come together to build the shape and define it. And, you know, you have all these circles. So, I mean, there's no way to make this shape with all these little circle things out of just one long strand. So we had to do some tricks. And for me, the trick is to cap all the ends with loops. And then here in the center, the secret is these kissing loop interactions. And this allows us to branch and then join distant parts of a structure together in a sequence-specific and organized fashion. So th this is uh, also why I'm designing these kissing loop labs in Eterna, because actually having more of these structures will allow us to make bigger RNA designs. And these, these things are really cool. They can co-transcriptionally fold, which means that they, they're produced while the enzyme's making them, and they're produced at body temperature and over a time scale of about 15 minutes, which means that 
15 minutes after I added enzymes to the DNA, I took this into the AFM and got a picture of it. And so that means you don't have to wait for a week uh, on a needling ramp, and you don't have to mix a bunch of components together and think about their stoichiometry. I think I took one microliter exactly of DNA and put it in the, and then mixed it with one microliter of polymerase and then let it go. Uh, and well, those are small still. Uh, we want to be able to scale up further. And so for this study, the furthest we got was this structure, which is six helices tall. And it's 660 nucleotides long. And that's, that's still a far cry away from the ribosome structure. But uh, we're able to make them. And you see, th these aren't covering the whole surface with perfect structures anymore. They're still pretty small. But I think in principle, the basic unit, the tile, is working quite well. And so the largest assembly we saw was this one. And this is a, um, just a 3D model showing you know, where every single tile should be. Um, but I will point out that this was, this was annealed. It was not produced continuously in an enzymatic way, so it wasn't co-transcribed. Um, we're working on that still. Um, but I think it's good progress. And really, this quote from two of the leaders in the field kind of sums up what we're, what we're going for. And we want to rationally design objects comparable in size and complexity to natural RNA machines. And that's the ribosome and the spliceosome. And so I'm near the end of the talk, and I just want to end kind of with this roadmap of, of where we go. And so here, here's a map of different structures. And at the bottom here are about 10 helices wide, and you know, about on the 100 nucleotides length is the tRNA. A little bigger are some enzymes like RNase P and group 1 introns. A little bigger than that is the group 2 intron, which is like pretty good. And th these introns are cool functional molecules that can go and splice RNA signals. Uh, but then, you know, the small unit of the ribosome is way up here, and I think the, the large unit would probably be up here, off, even off the corner of the map here. It's not even on the scale of this. And so where, where do these structures that we just produced fit? Well, we're not doing bad, but we're still not even halfway up to the size of the small subunit. And, but we are in the size range of some fairly large and useful RNAs. And uh, so here in the faded version, you see the group 2 intron. Uh, so by comparison, group 2 introns are about 500 nucleotides in scale, and they compose like 35 range, range of that number of helices. So we have about the same number of helices and the same length. But what we haven't reached yet is the three-dimensional complexity of this, which is, you know, flavors of nucleotides that, that pair together. So uh, but I think we'll get there soon. And also, you know, Riju will probably tell you that the that Eterna itself is working on making things more in this range, uh, you know, by freeform designing RNA and that but was your your work previously yeah. uh, involved complexes that were that, that this big or bigger. Composed of eight uh, so sure. Separate RNA. So, so the, the challenge is, can we make something that that scale out of a single strand? I think that's actually a lot harder. But uh, yeah. So it's, to summarize, here here's the scale that we worked for, starting at 156 nucleotides, going up to about 660, and we made some hexagonal lattices. But really, we want to get away from tiling these structures, and can we just kind of go all out, make a really long strand that forms up into some complicated shape? And here all the, the different kissing loops are color-coded. Um, and if you look, I kind of reused a few because right now we only have eight. Um, but hopefully after this round two of kissing loop lab, we'll have 300. <laughs> so we'll see. Huh? So we'll see this. Yeah. We're going to see this soon. Yeah. So, okay. So, so, so this is a big complicated shape, but I just wanted to show you, like, this looks nice the way I drew it out and this thing. But, you know, to NUPAC, it just looks like a bunch of stuff like this. And, I mean, I'm amazed that NUPAC can even consider this. But this is 3,500 nucleotides, and we want to, you know, have this dream of some polymerase going around and producing it, but I think it's really hard. Uh, but what's cool is that I think tools like Eterna give us a new way to think about sequence design and a new way to reach it, and maybe this problem is reachable if, you know, one guy, you know, designs maybe this top piece, and maybe somebody else can design that, and somebody else like that, and maybe we can, like, you know, piece all these fragments together, you know, so that's not, like, one huge problem, but a bunch of small problems. And just for example, like I just want to refer to, you know, a fairly large, uh, notorious structure that uh, that I found in Eterna. It's only 1,250 nucleotides, so we just need to go like, you know, three times bigger than this to 
but I think we're well on our way. So uh, thanks to Hagla Who for designing this horrible disaster. I tried to play it and it just broke my computer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe more realistically, another way we can think about it is using what we already have in hand to functionalize. So here I put some of my favorite things. Uh, some of you may know the MS2 code protein binds to a little hairpin. Like we can actually put little tiny binding sites on the scaffolds we already have and do some pretty cool things with them. So um, I, I'm kind of looking forward to the future of already the RNA scaffolds that we have in hand to work with. Um, and of course, this work was done in collaboration with Eva Anderson and Paul Rotherman at Caltech. And it's been kind of a collaboration across a very large ocean, and we managed to make it work. And it was a <laughs> super cool project. Um, and also the uh, molecular programming project, uh, which just recently invited us out to California to to give a presentation. And that happens to be why I just hopped over to Bay to come over here and visit Stanford and Eternal Lab. And so, thank you very much, Riju, for inviting us and hosting us here. So, oh, I'm so sure there's a few questions. Yeah, uh, let's, let's thank uh, Cody and Eva. <laughs> there are lots of questions. So, while I'm collecting them, um, questions from local audience first. And the question, why do you think that size matters? I mean, like, uh, you, the goal would be to like, build something bigger and bigger and bigger, but, but if you have something that works, like ribosome, but it's much smaller, it's elegant, you can make it, you know, in one run, so what's the point to make something that has the same function, but it's like, you know, more complicated, <laughs> more diverse, you know, it looks cool, you know, <laughs> if you see. But then, uh, and of course, if you compare to ribosome, ribosome is like power RNAs and proteins. Yeah. And then you had probably you use the stitches that you were talking about, so maybe it's not the best thing to compare with. <laughs> you know, just, uh, okay, so I do think you have a point. Maybe we don't have to go... RNAs can potentially do more things. And why is the ribosome so big? Well, it does a heck of a lot more than just bind tRNAs and mRNA and then spit out some protein. Like, I think actually to do that, all you need is domain 5 of the ribosome. It's very tiny. Uh, what's all the rest of it do? It stabilizes it. It helps the structure to do proofreading. It helps to prevent things from making mistakes. And, and so as the demand for fidelity and production of proteins goes up, well, the size of the ribosome goes up too. And so that's more maybe an evolutionary artifact that these things are so big. But it seems to me that like big structures are really robust. It's like if you're on the highway and a little tiny, um, you know, Mini Cooper, or, and then some guy with a giant Humvee comes, like who's gonna win? Um, <laughs> maybe you want to be the big guy on the highway. Like and actually, you know, it can be faster. That's true. <laughs> yeah. be exactly. So, so, so we like, want we want actually structures in both both ranges. So I was just kind of making it maybe a silly metaphor there, but. <laughs> Yeah, I could make be also a, a chip in. So, so, so of course, uh, yeah. Uh, normally, if you keep it simple, uh, that, that's of course a, a nice scientific uh, goal. And, and, and definitely, for some of the application we're thinking of, of course, we we are only going to like design the RNA scaffold that's going to solve the particular job inside the cell that we want to to work with. But, but to our mind, we are also somehow playing Legos here. And, and, and we, we also yeah, kind of want to show yeah, how this uh, architecture that we're building is that, that it's scalable, that we can grow uh, large structures. So, so that's kind of one thing. So, so it's more like from a theoretical point of view, how, how big can we grow it and, and how, how well does this uh, basic uh, uh, structure extend? Uh, but, but then I also think for, for the, the future, really, if you want to make uh, really uh, yeah, advanced nanotechnology inside the cell, we, we basically need these kind of pegboards to uh, yeah find yeah proteins in different patterns and so on so 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 it's not we're, we're not just trying to reproduce what biology just does we're also trying to yeah make uh, options for for engineering uh, uh, yeah inside the cell so so I think yeah time will tell but maybe large structures uh, uh, will be, be have some nice applications yeah You know, it actually, uh, it's it's on the radar. Um, it, actually, Jordan Kems came and proposed this to me uh, using some NC protein maybe that like would help to par partially melt the RNA a little bit 
soften it and so then it doesn't like get stuck in some misfolds. Um, that's definitely something we might consider. But I think really what we want to do is, is try to go inside of cells and then in that case then I guess the things are already there. So hopefully it plays nice. Yeah, yeah more questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do. I do actually have a supporting figure. So this is this is not published yet. Um, it's a it's a bit of a relic from my PhD work that, that, <laughs> that we're we're going to try to get it out there. But in the supporting info, we have a, a like a library of like mangled, misfolded stuff. And um, actually, it looks like the basic units, the parts that build it up, are right. What what the misfolding happens is from these like kissing loop uh, interactions that join all the parts together. They're very sticky, and sometimes they they, they kind of stick in the wrong place, or or they they like a dimer of two things will get stuck together, and so you see you see some aggregation due to that. And that's also um, one of the things we want to do is have a, a library of really weak kissing loops that that aren't going to be like sticking everywhere in the wrong spot. So that's also, I'm really excited to see the new round of shape work this February. When's it coming? Soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have any, have you tested for orthogonality of those uh, loops also? Uh, the, the eight loops that we have are tested for orthogonal, or for, for mm -hmm. orthogonality, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but of course, when we get more of them, uh, we'll have to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to get eternal question. I'm going to ask one follow-up question to uh, Magnus' question, uh, which is that you showed us these, some of these RNAs, like, um, like the ribosome, you know, obviously we idolize them, <laughs> but they have, they make um, their own chaperones. Uh, they make hundreds <laughs> or thousands of other proteins and RNAs that help themselves get processed and folded. Um, so what, I mean, what's your sense? Do you think we're going to have to do the same thing? Well, um, I actually do think part of the future of RNA is actually RNP, so those are ribonucleoproteins. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if we want to play in a cell, we, we don't just want to be like <laughs> naked R. So it's, it's called naked RNA um, because it's like actually it's it's kind of vulnerable. I think uh, just the <laughs> RNA molecule itself, like a ribonuclease, can come and just munch it up and it's little bits. Eva showed a bunch of cartoons of these horrible things, wrists and stuff coming and slicing it up and all sorts of stuff. RNA is getting chopped up all the time, but I think if we give it some armor. Uh, so of proteins, maybe it will last a little longer in a cell. So I, I, I see that in the future. Of see that definitely is a necessity. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, that's we'll my opinion. Yeah, capsid. Yeah. Armor. Okay, so quick, some questions from the um, tournament players. Uh, first one. Um, we'll come back and have those question at the end for sure. Um, how strong is the RNA mesh, the honeycomb lattice? How, how strong is the lattice? Any measurements, yeah. uh, no, I haven't made measurements of it, but um, I'll say it's really strong. Uh, so one of the tests of it, and, and I, I think by strong it could mean two things, like physically strong uh, or robust. And I think it might maybe actually is both. Um, and the cool test was I, I took a guy who had never done AFM before, and he had never worked with RNA before, and I said, here, take this, DNA, this polymerase and DNA and mix them together, and then put it on his mica and go image it on AFM. He'd never done any of those things before, and then he came back with an image of a, a bunch of hexagons on a, on, a, on a screen, and I'm like, wow, it worked. <laughs> so uh, I think that if someone who has no ex prior experience can go in and use this AFM and like you know use a lot of force to image it and it's not coming apart. That's a good mm, sign because up to this point, uh, um, I know you saw the hearts. So I spent probably two years in the AFM trying to get one picture of that thing. It's so weak and like it's delicate. And this stuff is you're able to repeatedly image it every time. And so somehow maybe just being two helices wide means it's it's more than twice as strong. But uh, I don't have any measurements yet. That's actually uh, maybe a cool thing to do in the future. <clears throat> I'm sure there are folks at iNano who can, who can measure the strength of a nanomaterial um, or, and compare them to the nanofabrics that you, you uh, designed with RNA earlier. Yeah. Do you think these are stronger? Oh, much stronger. <laughs> <laughs> They're much stronger because I already know that the, the previous one, just under the imaging force of the AFM, are okay, ripping up. They're coming apart. Yeah. And these ones um, you can image repeatedly. And I, I don't have it on hand, but that, that picture where I showed up the perfect hexagons, like I imaged it, I think four times in a row, and
at one tile, you could you have like one tile would come up off of it at a time. You could actually see that. Uh, so maybe, maybe I should have shown it. It would have been kind of cool. But okay. We have to pick our battles. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to Nando's early question for both of you, which is, when are we going to get to dynamic RNA machines? <laughs> no, that's really hard to and do. Yeah, but yeah, so so yeah, so so the the ribosome is, uh, is an RNA uh, nano machine, and 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 of course, uh, yeah, that, that's our our uh, aim to try to do some of these things. So, but but uh, but basically, one can also start uh, really simple here. So so one is just uh, these riper switches that are being designed it in Eterna. Actually, uh, yeah, having a small molecule that binds to an RNA changes its conformation. So one can already like build these elements into to some of these uh, RNA origami tiles and then change its it, it might change uh, the position of helices on the other side of the tile. So we already uh, by having these structures, we already have some some structures and some where we can do nanomechanical uh, uh, yeah, changes. So yeah, so but basically. Uh, we are envisioning some simple systems first, uh, but then later trying to do more complicated stuff. Yeah. I should say to internal players, we have someone else locally in the audience who will who has actually created a few dynamic RNA uh, motors, and maybe later in the year we can invite him to give a uh, pop-up talk to internal <laughs> players when it's uh, when you feel ready. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll and I hope that when you are also making your RNA robots will get you back on for um, So there's a really big positive response from all the players, which I'll show you guys the chat box afterwards. Um, and, um, and thanks thanks very much for visiting and giving us this open broadcast. Yeah, great. Yeah, that was really fun. <laughs>